Great day to be alive in Murrieta, California. Sun-kissed, Pacific cooled, mountain girded, community oriented, and servant led. If you are with a friend this morning, or more relative, and we haven't seen you for a while, welcome back. We're really glad that you are here. And if you're a guest this morning, and this is your first time with us, we are super glad that you are here as well. And uh, we want you to come back and be with us in another time, because our two full-time ministers aren't here today. Uh, Doug and Garrett and their families are in Culver City at the Culver Palms Church of Christ. They're celebrating their 75th anniversary this weekend. And they've invited all the former ministers to come back and be with them for this celebration. And so they're flying in from all over the country. And Doug was a youth minister there 23 years ago. So they've invited him and his family to be back. And they'll be returning this evening. And so we want you to come back so you can get to know Doug, who is our full-time pulpit minister, and Garrett, who's our youth and family minister. And our third minister is back in the back with the Spanish speakers. And so as I'm bringing a message to you today, he's back there bringing a message to those who would like to have a message in Spanish. His name is Bert Parker. So please come back and get to know these guys. And I want you to come back tonight too. What's happening tonight? Fifth Sunday singing. We've never done a fifth Sunday singing. We used to do fourth Sunday singings. But now we're going to do a fifth Sunday singing because Danny, our, our worship coordinator, has ordered some books that have additional hundred songs that are not in our current collection. So we're going to be practicing some of those songs tonight so that we can introduce them on Sunday morning. So please, please come back tonight, six o'clock. We're going to practice some of these songs. Quincy, who led our worship this morning, and Danny, who led our time around to the communion table, are going to be in charge. They're going to be introducing some of those new songs. So please come and be with us. We'll do this four times a year and try to get to know some of these new songs. All right, I want you to think about this. <clears throat> if you were to describe our culture today, I would think, as I was struggling with this this week, that it would be a time of competing voices. There are so many voices that are demanding my attention. You just turn on the TV and what happens? They're trying to sell you this, they're trying to sell you this, they want you to go to this event, they want you to watch this sporting event, and that's a world of competing voices. And uh, you know, if we were to talk about what some of those voices might be in this multicultural situation that we're living, Western culture is multicultural now. It didn't used to be that way, but it's definitely multicultural. And scholars have said that there are eight factors of our multiculture. There's social sharing. Social sharing is what you might do around the kitchen table or what you might do with your roommate when you're sitting in your home and you're sharing, or you might do it electronically. Then there's religion. That's a big part of our culture. And there's history. And then language, economics. Can you guess what the others might be? Art, music, and government. All of those things contribute to our culture. And it wasn't always that way. I'm reading a novel right now about a church in a rural community in, uh, in England in the 1300s. And it happened at a time when the great Black Plague came across from Europe and it killed almost half the population of England. And so it's about this local community and how they dealt with all the challenges. And I just started thinking, you know, what were the dominant forces of the culture in the 1300s? It was basically the church and maybe the family. And the king had some kind of influence, the king and the lords of the various communities, but even they were subject to the will of the church. It was a lot different world back in the 1300s than it was even recently. And even as much as the 1900, in the 19th century, just 150 years ago, it was still church and family were the two dominant forces. Maybe local government, especially in the United States, was starting to take, have an influence, but it's pretty much just two or three different things. Then what happened in the 1950s? We got television. We had radio in the 30s, but we got television. And movies came to be a dominant part of our culture. And so all, you know, we wanted to dress like the people dressed on television. And we wanted to speak like the people spoke you know, in the movies. We tried to emulate the, their lifestyles. And that started creeping into our culture. But still, it was just two or three things in the 50s. But then what happened 20 and 30 years ago? Internet, personal computers, personal ways of communicating. And our culture just exploded 
with all the things that have come in to our culture. And so the void that would be in a person's life was filled pretty easily in the Middle Ages because it would just be the priest would say, well, you need Jesus. You need to come to church. You need to confess your sins. And even in the 19th century, it was pretty much just the church. But now we have all these voices competing for our attention. Everyone is clamoring for my attention. Whether it's the local sports team, you know, I love going to the um, Lake Elsinore Storm or down to the San Diego Padres or up to the Angels. I love doing that. But my favorite team is what, Don? Giants. I love the Giants. In fact, you've got Pablo Sandoval here today. At high school, I was an okay athlete. I did three sports a year. I was never first string. I was usually a third stringer. And so that's kind of my role today. I'm, I'm the pinch hitter, right? I'm Pablo Sandoval. He used to be a first stringer, but now he's a third stringer, right? He just comes in and pitch hits. Unfortunately, if you watch the game last night on TV, he always strikes out. <laughs> so we're, hope, we're hoping that the pinch hitter this morning uh, doesn't strike out. But anyway, uh, I love sports, and it's a big part uh, of my life, but it's not the dominant thing in my life. Um, when I was a kid, 12 years old, there was only one sport. It was just Little League, you know, when you're a 12-year-old. But then my children, when, when they got to be 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, there were a multiple number of sports that they could do. Yeah, they still had Little League, but then there was soccer with AYSO. There were basketball leagues. There was Pop Warner. But still, just four, and they would just go per season. But now what happens, those of you who have children who are between 8 and 15, they go all year round, don't they, those sports? How many of you drove down Cal Oaks and turned on Lincoln to come this way? How many of you? What did you see going on there Sunday morning? Girls softball. First there was practice, then there's softball. That didn't happen when I was a kid, and it only barely began to happen when my children were going to school, that we had Sunday morning practice and Sunday morning games. But now that's kind of taken over a big part of our culture. So we can ask ourselves, with all this noise coming from sports and entertainment and media and our cell phones and everything else, how do, do we then help our kids? How do we help our kids cut through all of that? And Lonnie's waving at me. I need to move this up a little bit closer. Is that better? Just have to take the tape off. How do we help our kids? Is that better? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Okay. How do we help our kids then cut through all that noise and just be able to just look at Jesus? So that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about proclamation. Who are the proclaimers in the Bible? Can you think who the proclaimers were? Ones who came with a message. Here are the ones that I brainstormed on Friday afternoon. There were angels, angels that came to Elizabeth and Mary and Hannah and others. What about the angels that, uh, that, that came to uh, the prophets of old and say, you need to go and bring this message? Or how about John the Baptist? He was the big proclaimer of the New Testament, wasn't he? And he would just come and say, prepare ye the way of the Lord. How, how many of you remember the, the, the musical Godspell from the 70s? It was just a great, great song that John the Baptist sings where he goes, prepare ye the way of the Lord. I'm not going to try to sing it uh, this morning. But then there are the Old Testament prophets. My favorite is Elijah. Name one of my kids Elijah because he'd always go to Ahab and say, you know what, Ahab? You really shouldn't be married to Jezebel. And you know what? There are going to be some things that are going to be happening to you because you're not following God. And then finally, I thought of the apostles, both during the time of Jesus when he would send them out and they would proclaim the day of the Lord, or during the book of Acts when they would go around and proclaim. So those are the proclaimers that I could think about. A proclaimer is someone who speaks the words of another. He or she does not speak his words, but they speak the words of another. And the word in the Greek is kata angelo, K-A-T-A, angelo. That's where we get the word angel, and it means herald. And we even have a, a Christmas carol that has the word herald in it. What is that? Hark, the herald angels sing. That goes back to the Greek word. A herald angel is someone who's bringing uh, the message of God. And that herald angel then brought the message to the shepherds. So Paul is unashamed about proclamation. That's what's so nice about Paul. He is unashamed. Because there were a bunch of mystery religions in the first century. And Paul addresses that in the, in the book to the Colossians. There are a bunch of mystery religions. And he says, you don't have to have special knowledge. 
Okay? There are a lot of secret societies and secret religions in the first century. We have secret societies today too. If you think of fraternities and sororities and different other organizations like the Masons, you have to have special knowledge. Well, Paul comes along and he says, you don't have to have special knowledge anymore. That mystery that was hidden for the ages is now revealed to you. And that's what he was proclaiming to them. And here's the verse in Colossians 1.27 where he says, To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's not a mystery anymore. It's something we're proclaiming to every person. So, have you ever just wanted to throw your hands up, though, because of all these voices? Do you get tired of all the, all the things that come into your life and are just pounding you and pounding you and pounding you? Just, well, you just want one clear voice so that I can hold on to that? Well, that's what Paul is saying to these Colossian brothers. He says in the next verse, Him we proclaim, admonishing everyone and teaching everyone that we might present everyone complete in Christ. Some of the more modern translations combine these things. They just say, it says teaching and admonishing everyone. But it wasn't that way in the Greek. Paul is such a good writer. Of course, we know he's not writing, he's dictating. We think he probably had bad, bad eyesight or maybe bad hands because a lot of his letters, at the end of his letter, he says, see how I write this so largely with my own hand. He, wasn't a, he, he couldn't see to write, so he dictated. But look how beautiful this phrase is. If you're an English teacher, you would see that. Him we proclaim. And it's so lyrical, admonishing everyone, teaching everyone that we might present everyone complete in Christ. That's our text for the day. Well, Paul, as an apostle, almost 2,000 years ago, said that there was one thing to proclaim, and that was Jesus. So if you're looking for one clear voice to make sense over all the noise that comes into our psyches today, it is Jesus. It is him that we proclaim. It's not politics. It's not social justice. It's not selfishness. It's Jesus. And that's good news. Now, Paul himself was proclaiming something that he did not believe in when he was younger. You remember the story of Paul? He was the biggest persecutor of the church because he thought these guys were heretics. But he had a revelation from Jesus on the Damascus Road, and he changed from being the greatest persecutor of the church to being the greatest defender of it. So who is Jesus that Paul is proclaiming? I almost went to the book of John when I asked myself that question this week. I almost went to the Gospel of John because John is so good about getting people to believe. And there are eight times that John's Gospel records that Jesus says, I am. And he said, what are those? I am way, the truth, and the life. What else? I am, I am the gate or the door. What else? I am the resurrection and the life. I am... I am the vine, good. I am the door. I am the bread of life. And that I am is the same phrase that God used to Moses back in Exodus. And he's saying, I'm that guy. That'd be a great study. Maybe sometime we should have a, a series of studies just on the I am's, because those claims of Christ were so good. Now, whenever you're reading the Bible, a paragraph in the Bible or a phrase, be careful not to take it out of context. And so what I did when I read this 128, him we proclaim. I went back and read a couple of paragraphs before, and I read a couple of paragraphs afterwards, because that's the best way to understand a piece of scripture. And so, if you go back and you look at, first, at Colossians 1, verses 15 to 20, I'm going to spend a few minutes on that, because it's probably the most succinct passage that talks about Jesus and all of the encompassing descriptors of him. So where was Colossae? This may be too small for you to see, but this orange line is the third missionary journey. And he went back and visited all those uh, towns in Cilicia and Galatia that he had visited before, and then the book of Acts skips over to Ephesus. So he went from there to Ephesus. So how did he get to Ephesus over on the western end of Turkey, which was called Asia Minor at the time? Well, you can see the scholars have listed that route. He probably went right through Colossae. Book of Acts doesn't record that he stayed there, doesn't record that he preached there, didn't go to a synagogue there, but he went to Ephesus and he spent three years there. And the Bible records that he sent disciples out all over the place. That's probably how the Colossian church started, 
We don't think that Paul ever went there. But 25 years later now, when he's in prison in Rome, he's writing back to Colossae. And he knew some of the people there. And he sent who? Onesimus. He sent Onesimus back to Colossae, and that's where the book of Philemon comes from. So there are all kinds of connections to Colossae, but we don't think Paul had ever been there except just to travel through. So, Colossians 1, 15 and following. He says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. It is so hard to get a full image of something that's invisible, isn't it? I mean, can you give me a picture of wind? I don't think so. We see the effects of wind. Can you give me a picture of gravity? I kind of can. We understand gravity because when we drop something, it goes to the ground. But you can't really see gravity, right? But we see the effects of it. Well, Paul is saying Jesus is like that. He made the invisible visible. That's pretty astounding, isn't it? So whether it's things like trees or stars or a pin, he brought it to life. Then he says that he is the firstborn of all creation. He was there when the world was made. It does not mean that he was the first created thing, but that he is preeminent. He is above all else. He is the highest honor possible in all the universe. That's pretty significant, isn't it? Now, in the case of his readers and us, now almost 2,000 years later, do not fully understand, he goes on to the next verse. And he says this, By him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, things visible and indivisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. And so you're probably going, wait a second, wait a second. I thought God was the creator. But here Paul is telling us that Jesus was involved in creation. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? We always say, thank you, God, for creation. Well, Jesus was there. He was the firstborn of all creation. And all things were made by him and for him. That's pretty amazing to a Jewish mind, but also to a Greek mind. So he's saying, well, you think angels are great? Yeah, that's true. But Jesus is even greater. Then he said... He is before all things, and in whom all things hold together. Have you ever, ever wondered why you just don't float off? You know, and just kind of float off into the sky? You know, have you ever wondered why ice floats, even though it's more dense than water, why it floats instead of going to the bottom of a river? You know, all other elements in their dense form, in their solid form, they're heavier, right? But for some reason... Water, in its solid form, goes to the top. What would happen if water went to the bottom? We'd probably all die. Have you ever thought about that? If, water went to the, if ice went to the bottom and water flew over it, it would never melt. Okay? Well, God, and Paul is saying here that all these things, these wonderful things that men and women are discovering throughout the centuries, it was all done by Jesus. All the laws of the universe were done by Jesus. Why? For our benefit. That's pretty comforting, isn't it? In him, all things hold together. The word is cohere. All things cohere because of Christ and for Christ. Is there any other religious leader whose disciples after that religious leader left said amazing things like this? Did Muhammad's disciples say weird things and fantastic things like this? Did Zoroaster's disciples say things like this? Did Buddha's? No, they didn't. That's what makes the Christian religion so amazing, is that the writers, after Jesus left, described him to us in these magnanimous ways. So that's the cosmic view of Jesus. Now he goes to something more local. He says he's the head of the body. He gives kind of a corporate view of Jesus. He says he's like the CEO. He's, he's the brains of the outfit, I guess is what we might say today. Jesus is the head of the body. And he uses the word corpus, if you had it in Latin, corpus meaning the body. He's the thing that makes my eyes, my ears, my hands, my feet, my muscles, my nervous system. He's the one who makes all of that work. Now what Paul is saying here is that Jesus is king. If you were to look at this body here at Murrieta, all the different parts... 
Who would you say the nervous system would be? I think it's Lisa Sturgis. You know, because she runs the office and she communicates to all the ones, different ones of us, right? And she gets messages out. So she, in this particular body, I think the nervous system of this body is Lisa Sturgis. How about the hands? Who do you think the hands of this body are? Who? I think it's somebody we just lost. I think it's Austin. Austin is the one who is head of benevolence, has such a heart for all the people who were suffering, and he would give out food, he would give out meal cards, he would give out um, um, a card to help them get gasoline, to get to the next city, whatever it was. He was the hand, he was our hands. Who was the heart? I think it's Mike Swagger. Because Mike Swagger has so much compassion for people who are hurting, and his heart just goes out to them, and then he tends to meet their needs. And there may be others like that. You might try to do that sometime in your quiet time. Think of, who are the hands? Who are the feet? Who are the ears? Who are the eyes of this particular body? Well, guess what? Jesus is the head. Jesus is the brains. He's the one who puts it all together. Why so much emphasis on being the head, the firstborn, the image of the invisible God, the beginning, the creator? Because he's the most important thing in our lives. What, what happens when you meet a celebrity? You know, you know that Sandy and I lived in Malibu for 30 years, so we saw celebrities all the time. There's only one grocery store. And so, you know, it's a small community, just 13,000 people. And so one time, Sandy was in line at, uh, at the local market, the Ralph's, and she was standing behind uh, Michael Landon, you know, the actor. And she got into a conversation with him because she knew his daughter. His daughter was attending Pepperdine. In fact, I think she might have been one of Sandy's interns. And so he, he thanked, she thanked um, Michael Landon for you know, having a, raising a good daughter and for her contributions to the Pepperdine community. And then what was the first thing she said when she walked into the door when she got home? Guess who I saw at Ralph's today? I saw Michael Landon. And that's just natural that we do that. You know, I, at basketball one time, um, Kobe Bryant came as just a fan to sit in the stands and, and, and watch the game. What was the first thing I said to Sandy when I got home? Guess who was at the basketball game? Kobe Bryant. And it's just natural. I, I'm not a psychologist. I don't know why we do that. But we tend to, you know, want to lift ourselves up by saying, guess who I got to talk to today? Or guess who I saw at the gas station today? Or something like that. And you guys could probably say the same thing. And so we like, you know, to kind of elevate ourselves by being close to others. But, you know, the Colossians didn't get to see Jesus. This is 25, 30 years after the time that Jesus went back up to heaven, and it was mostly a Gentile uh, congregation, not many Jews in this particular congregation. And so he is saying, you know, you didn't get to see Jesus, but I'm going to describe Jesus to you and let him know that he's firstborn, he's head, and as such, he should be the greatest celebrity that you have ever met, and more than a celebrity, our forgiver, our redeemer, and our brother. But Paul does not stop with the head. He says that Christ was not only active in the beginning, but he was also active in the beginning of the church. He was the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. You know, there were a lot of people, not a lot, but a number that, that were raised from the dead, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. But guess what? They died again. They died again. Jesus is the only person to die and then be raised and never to die again. And so he says he is not only head, but he's the firstborn from among the dead. And then he, goes, then he goes on to say, why? So that he might have supremacy. You know, we've got a Supreme Court. Is that supreme? Only as far as the laws in this country are concerned. We've got a president. Is he supreme? Only as far as what he can do for our country. We've got a local city council. Are they supreme? Only as to the regulations they make on how I run my life and my city and the speed limit and all that kind of stuff. They are not supreme. Jesus, Paul is saying, is supreme. Why? Because he rose from the dead. And that's exciting. Now, you would think that would be enough, right? But then he goes on to say, he's the fullness of God dwells in him. I can't, I can't get my mind around that. The fullness of God dwells in a human form? That's pretty amazing. See, the Greeks and the Romans believed in a multiplicity of gods. I think I have that slide up here. Yeah, this is Mars Hill, 
And that's the Acropolis and the Parthenon in the background. And, it, and they've been rebuilding this thing for about 20 years. The Greeks are kind of slow when they're remodeling stuff. Anyway, that's Mars Hill right in the front. And what did Paul say when he went to Mars Hill? Hmm, these are all Greeks, not Jews. I see that you guys are really religious because you've got idols to everybody. You cover every little idol that goes to every little stream and hill all around the whole countryside. You've got an idol for that. You've got a little demigod. But you know what? You wanted to cover your bases, and so what? You've got a statue to the unknown god. What a great opening line to a non, to non believer, right? To a non Jew. You've got a statue to the unknown God, and I'm here to talk about that unknown God. What a great opening line he did. Well, that was done at the Acropolis. And here are some of the gods. There was Zeus, who was king of the gods, Venus, who was the goddess of love, Athena, the goddess of reason, Artemis, or Diana, which was, you know, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. That was in Ephesus, just about 100 miles away. Then there was Mars, the god of war, and Bacchus, the god of wine. There are all kinds of gods. And then Paul is writing to them and saying, guess what? Our God is the fullness of all these. You divide all the attributes of God up into a thousand different little demigods. I'm going to talk about the one who's over all. I'm talking about the number one. And guess what? He didn't keep it to himself. He put all that fullness into his son, Jesus. That just kind of blows my mind, doesn't it? And I bet it blew the mind of these Colossians. Then he says, through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether the things on earth or things in heaven. We are all breakers of God's law. But as Danny shared with us at the table this morning, Jesus came and sacrificed himself so he might reconcile us to him. And what's interesting is that he didn't just stop it there. In the next chapter, in chapter 2, he says it another way. He says, in Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And then he adds this phrase to it. Christ, in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. How exciting is that? God is fullness, which is hard. His son Jesus is fullness. And then once you die to yourself, you get to be fullness. Can you think you're a Colossian people and you just heard or just read that from this letter? God is fullness, Jesus is fullness, and you get to be fullness. That's pretty amazing. Once you're reconciled to him and you're a fullness because of his blood. Are you ever discouraged as a Christian to have doubts? I know I do. You know, I read something, I go, oh, wow, how does that conflict with Christianity? Or someone talks to me and they say, hmm, something. I go, oh, wow, I'd better struggle with that. Everybody has doubts. It's not a sin to have a doubt. But when those things happen, I have to remind myself of this. God is fullness. Jesus is fullness. And he gives his fullness to me. How? A Holy Spirit. He said, and that's comforting. No pun intended on that. That's comforting. Because he says, I'm going to leave, but I'm going to send another comforter, and he's going to guide you to all truth. He is going to elevate you, and he's going to fill you, that Holy Spirit. And he finally, the result of this comforting is that we get to have peace. So let's go back to 228. And I'm sorry, Lonnie, it looks like it's doing it again, and I apologize. I'm not the best on technology. I told Lonnie that I'm, I'm not geeky, I'm goofy. <laughs> so Doug, Doug helped me uh, put this uh, PowerPoint together. So Paul says, we proclaim him. Who was the most famous proclaimer in Greek culture? It happened in 490 B.C. Okay, his name was Pheidippides. What did Pheidippides do? There he is right there. There was a battle between the Greeks and the Persians. And the Persians had a superior army and the Greeks had an inferior army. And they were a few miles away from, from Athens. And so they decided we're gonna do something radical. They attacked the Persians. They were so surprised by it, but all these Persians got in their boats and decided to sail around the south part of Greece and come into Athens from a different uh, direction. And the commander, the general of the Greek army said, uh-oh, we're not there to defend Athens. So he sent Pheidippides to run Remember, we have examples of that from David and Absalom's time. Remember from the Old Testament? He sent Pheidippides to run from the battlefield to Athens. And he runs and he runs and he runs. 
and he gets to the Senate, and he falls down, and he's about to die, and he says this word, Naniki Kamen, Naniki Kamen. It means rejoice, we have the victory. Can you think of an apparel company that took that word and made an apparel company out of it? Nike, that's where they get the word. It's from Pheidippides, who ran how many miles? 26, 26 miles, 40 kilometers, to warn the Athenians that they better be prepared because the Persians were coming in from another direction. This is the road from Marathon to uh, Athens. And there's a statue of Pheidippides, you know, as he's making his um, announcement to the Senate in Rome. So Paul is telling the Colossian Greek citizens that we are now heralds. You and I are heralds like Pheidippides, bringing good news that is much more important than the battle results. We are proclaiming Christ, firstborn from the dead, head of the body, one in whom the fullness of God dwells. That is good news. And proclamations are just important today, as we said at the beginning, because there are so many voices vying for our attention. I made up some Greek gods. I looked at all those Greek gods, you know, that you can just find them on the internet. There are hundreds, maybe thousands of them. And I made up some Greek gods today. Who do you think the Greek gods are today that are vying for our attention? How about Bacchus always us? The alcohol culture. You know, you want to solve your problems? Go to Bacchus. How about this one? Deus ex cannabisis. <laughs> Especially here in California, right? That's, that's pretty a, much a strong God in our culture. Or how about Servius Selfius? <laughs> me first, right? That, that's the big one for me. I serve myself. So I'm, I'm tempted by this one all the time. How about money and maximum? This is the Wall Street God, right? Greed is good. Or how about entertain us all the time us? <laughs> what do you do when you come into the house? You either turn on your radio or you turn on the TV or you turn on music, right? We have got to have something filling this void. We cannot have silence. Entertain us all the time us. Or how about connect me as 24 7 us? You know, we can laugh at it, but we learned, some of us went to a seminar a few weeks ago, and we learned that some of our young people, this is a lesson for you guys, okay? Some of our young people, because you have several ways of connecting, your computer, your phone, your, what, what else is there? That's all I have. <laughs> okay. Some young people today, when they add up all the hours from those several things together, it's 18 hours a day. We have to be connected. And if we as Christians are tempted by that kind of connectedness, maybe we're not proclaiming Jesus. Maybe we're proclaiming something else. We choose to not be swayed by these cultural temptations. We proclaim him. We're the only voices, the only heralds that God has. Are you complete in Christ today? We can get you completed. We've got a baptistry right here. If, you have, if you're a person of faith and you have not died to self, you're incomplete. You have not died to self to get that Holy Spirit living inside of you, to rise and walk a new life. Do you need prayer? Is there a time when you've been away from God and you need to rededicate yourself? Well, the elders are going to be standing in the back here, and you want to pray with an elder, just, just go to the back and have one of those guys pray with you. We're going to be singing a song, and Lonnie, you can go ahead and put it up there because I'm going to introduce it. And this is Above All Else. And I think we've only sung it once here before. And um, there it is. It says, you are exalted, Lord, above all else. Why did Paul write to them? It was to convince the Colossians that Jesus was supreme. Now, I want to sh show something on this um, song. You are exalted, Lord, above all else. Then there's a quarter note rest. See that quarter note rest at the end of that phrase? What do you think that means? Why did, why did the writer of this song put that in there? We're supposed to, as a cappella singers, use our hands, okay? We place you at the highest place above all else. Okay, I want you to practice it because 
we're not really comfortable clapping our hands, okay? I'm going to say the words and you practice clapping, okay? You are exalted, Lord, above all else. That's it, that's it. Do you know there are nine times in the Old Testament where we're told to praise by clapping? We're told to praise by clapping. My favorite is, clap your hands, all you people, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. That's from Psalm 47. So Quincy's going to lead us in this song, and if you, have a, if you want to respond, you can come forward down here, or you can go to the back, and we're going to sing it aggressively by clapping when those quarter note rest. I'll kind of be your model, but then at the end, after we sing it through twice, we're going to go back and sing that first phrase four times. We'll go, you are exalted, Lord, above all else. Then we'll sing it, you are exalted, Lord, above all else. You are exalted, Lord, above all else. You are exalted, Lord, above all else. Now, when we sing it through those four times at the end, we're gradually going to get softer and softer, okay? So use your hands during the two verses, and then a little bit softer as we get to the end. Let's stand and sing. <laughs> 